So I'm making a bunch of random videos on a bunch of topics this spring, hopefully, that are all going to tie together into some, you know, big and fancy stuff like the things you see in the background. But in this video, I want to try and approach, um, you know, the representation theory, uh, some representation theory for some stuff that you'll see in like the local Langlands and oh, yeah, very fancy, whatever. But I really want to try and start with a, a pretty low level idea. So if you have some familiarity with what representations and representation theory is um, and the notion of piatic numbers, then you can probably watch this uh, watch this video and get something out of it. So that's the idea is we're just going to try and approach some of these things more simply and then eventually ramp up uh, to the fancy or proper versions um, of these things. So let's see how it goes. Let's see if uh, that's of interest to people. Um, and I got a brand new pen, digital pen. Let's hope it works well. Okay, so the thing to, we're starting off with the representation theory of the piatic numbers. Uh, really, all of this can re be replaced with, you know, some finite extension of the piatic numbers. Uh, but again, for now, let's just keep things as like unfancy as possible. So uh, we've got the piatic numbers, right? Uh, the piatic numbers is itself, uh, you know, group under addition. Um, it has a maximal compact um, subgroup under addition. Uh, it's also a group under multiplication. And I, I bet you can't guess what the maximal compact group is under multiplication. <laughs> Uh, yeah, of course, it's the multiplicative group of this thing. Uh, okay, so that's cool. Uh, what we want to do, though, is uh, generalize this a little bit. You know, we've got a field, so we can do linear algebra. And uh, what is um, the multiplicative uh, piatic numbers other than uh, you know, the automorphisms of just the vector space of piatic numbers, which is to say the group GL1 QP, right? So a little more generally, you know, one thing we might consider is to try and study uh, the group of N by N invertible matrices with elements in the piatic field. So let me back up even more for a second. Like, why Why are we doing this? From a pure, like, we're trying to do representation theory, right? Let's motivate it through the lens of representation theory. So, you know, we do representation theory on finite groups. And, uh, okay, you know, we come up with the classification of all finite simple groups. Um, and also the, the representation theory is, like, very well understood. You know, we've got this, like, theory of characters and class functions and you know, we can compute conjugacy classes, all these things, right? Um, okay, it doesn't mean it's easy if someone gives you some totally random group, you know, but it's like, it's at least been made all methodical, you know, it's essentially worked out, like we can, we can do representation theory of a lot of finite groups. And you might get bored with that. And you might say, Okay, well, give me something infinite. Well, just random infinite groups is like too. it's so general. It's like saying a group, right? Well, what are you gonna what are you going to say about that? Let's study some groups with some structure, right? So the first thing you normally do is you study like Lie groups, right? GLN R, you know, the, the group of rotation matrices, uh, SUN, you know, special unitary group over the complex number, something like this. Uh, sweet. And these all have, you know, the structure of a manifold. And especially when you get to like the representation theory of the complex groups, right? Well, now there's a really nice theory. You know, we've got classification of semi-simple Lie algebras and we can like differentiate representations and stuff. And this is all, you know, some very nice, beautiful world. But 
you know, what happens? Uh, we now we want to go a little bit further. We want to say, okay, well, what other groups are there, right? So, like, probably something topological. And a weird thing is going to happen uh, here that there's, you know, there's there's this theory that I'm going to make some videos on very soon called algebraic groups. Right. And so this is, you know, this has to do with algebraic geometry and setting things up in that way. And the thing is, like, we get algebraic groups over in this world. But very oftentimes, you know, if you've if you've studied any of these things, there's sort of a mishmash of, of terms and concepts from the algebraic group world. But we normally consider a non-algebraic topology, right? There's the it, we consider the standard topology that gets picked up here from R and C. So in the same way, we're going to study the matrices over this group. And uh, we're also we're gonna we're gonna look at the piadic topology that this comes from, right? So, what do I mean by that? Well, the piadic numbers have a topology. So the piadic numbers to any, you know, we can just take the product topology on the piadic numbers n squared, and of course with within there is just uh, the n by n square matrices, right? Um, and it turns out, so some things that are important is that uh, this still has a uh, maximal compact subgroup. You might say, big whoop, why do we care? You know, why did I mention, why did I mention a maximal compact subgroup uh, before, right? Um, up here, you know, I talked about a maximal compact subgroup. Well, again, I mean, that's maybe not so surprising if you studied this stuff, Lee theory world. Um, but in general, let me just say, if you're not familiar, you know, and maybe I should have said this earlier in case it didn't scare you up. If you're not familiar so much with um, compact stuff or the idea or importance of the maximal compact subgroup, uh, you know, compactness is sort of this analog that we have in the infinite world for finite, right? We know, for example, that our continuous functions will achieve maximums on compact sets. Um, and so, you know, maybe there's some sort of finiteness analogs that work out. And indeed, if you study um, the Lee theory, right? There's a lot of things. The the representation theory of compact Lie groups happens to be particularly nice. And they are things like character theory, which worked so well in the finite world to carry over quite nicely to the infinite case, right? We don't get as lucky with non-compact stuff. Of course, the theory of characters is still important. Um, but then the idea is, well, okay, maybe, you know, the compact subgroups, the big compact subgroups, right, which captures as much information as possible, the maximal ones, you know, maybe those ought to at least get us a good chunk of the story of what's going on in the representation theory. So uh, that is why I'm highlighting uh, the fact that we have a maximal compact uh, subgroup here. Um, okay. Great, fantastic. So what do I want to say? Well, um, we want to, right, our goal is to study the representation theory of these things, right? So uh, representation theory, I want to understand uh, homomorphisms from this group to the group of invertible matrices over a complex vector space. Now, you might wonder why we choose a complex vector space, right? I mean, over here, we've got a uh, piadic field, and it would make sense to maybe choose some other piadic field, right? I mean, uh, the representation theory of, say, a finite group really doesn't matter what, uh, well, there's some fields that it matters for and some fields it doesn't, right? So if we have a fine, if we're studying the representation theory of a finite group, and it's GLVK, 
right? So if K is algebraically closed, so K equals K bar, um, and the characteristic of K is equal to zero, well, really, you can't tell the representation theory apart over any other characteristic zero algebraically closed field. Like as far as finite groups are concerned, you could put any field you want in there, which is a really interesting idea. Um, only recently I learned that this sort of thing is called a Lefschetz uh, principle, named after the mathematician Lefschetz. Um, where it's this idea that you have sort of field invariant stuff going on. Um, of course, if your field is not algebraically closed, then the representation theory gets uh, maybe more interesting, let's say, or if your characteristic is not equal to zero, right? If you're working over finite fields. Um, so you might say, well, going back over to our uh, piatic world, well, why don't we look at the representations um, over the any other characteristic zero field or even, uh, you know, QP or maybe QL for L not equal to P, right? A uh, uh, bar. And this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do and people do it. Um, however, there's a couple of things that we need to be careful of here. So algebraically speaking, uh, these things shouldn't really differ. But again, I don't want to lean too heavily on this in case you haven't studied uh, Lie groups before. But in you know the representation theory over here, part of what made it so nice is that you've got things like uh, GLNR, you've got some homomorphism into the invertible uh, linear transformations on a real vector space. And both of these things were manifolds. So you could take a derivative of this map and you could get some sort of map on tangent spaces and that just leads to this whole wonderful, beautiful theory, right? Um, and so in general, right, when we have some sort of extra structure on our group, say a manifold structure, topological structure, whatever, you know, there's there's sensibility in giving ourselves the restriction that, well, maybe we should only consider those representations that respect that uh, topological structure. You don't have to, you know, one could study. I haven't seen a lot about it, but you could study much like non-continuous, uh, non-differentiable representations of, say, the real numbers. Um, but for both practical and theoretical purposes, it just doesn't seem like that comes up so much, though it might be uh, potentially intriguing, um, though maybe just intractable, right? So probably when we go over here, we are going to want to ask something um, of this map in terms of the topology that we have available to us, right? We're probably going to want to ask that this map uh, respect some topological properties. And things get weird here. So um, as I understand it, uh, if we take the case of Q bar L, where L is not equal to P, then things are like pretty well understood. Things behave well, largely just because these topologies are not very comparable. Uh, in the same way, if we look at the, the complex numbers, its topology is just not really compatible with the piatic topology. So um, if you try and look at, say, uh, continuous maps from say QP, you know, think about this as GL1 into, into um, the complex numbers or more generally, uh, you know, just GLN over uh, QP. These, the, the continuous functions are just the locally constant ones. So what I mean for by locally constant is for all complex numbers, uh, 
there exists uh, an open set in uh, GLN QP such that um, the restriction, so a function, right, a function F, uh, so that F restricted to this open set uh, is a constant function. So that's very restrictive, right? That's like a pretty, pretty crazy batch of, of functions. I should say uh, with the standard uh, Euclidean topology, because there are, you can give C um, piadic topologies. And I'll talk about that another time or something. Uh, so, and, and, and if I'm not mistaken, something similar happens here. I don't remember, but it's, it's, it's well understood. Um, and then here, weird things happen because now we have compatible topologies, um, which is maybe that's good, right? Because like, again, what worked so well in Lee theory world, that's, you know, we had, you know, real manifold structure here. You know, there is some compatible topologies some some compatible geometry uh, over here. Well, maybe not. Well, we have something compatible, which is good, right? But this isn't a manifold, so we don't have differentiable stuff. And um, as I understand, weird things um, can happen in this topology. I mean, if you've seen the piadic topology before, you're probably no stranger to the fact that weirdness happens. So that doesn't answer the question why we're working with the complex numbers. Well, we should start somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, instead of this whole conversation, I suppose I, I could have just said, well, uh, we work with the complex numbers cause that worked so well for us when we did finite groups, right. As a first pass. Um, but I guess in the name of honesty, I want to have this diversion, right? Because, well, there wasn't anything special really about the complex numbers, um, for finite groups other than the fact that it was algebraically closed and characteristic zero. So here uh, we're going to say, well, you know, the, here in the name of honesty, there is a big difference. So we got to pick something to start with first. And maybe there's other more conceptual reasons. Well, there are. Um, certainly, eventually we're heading towards talking about the Langlands program. And uh, while well, these other things show up in the Langlands program too, uh, but so does this, right? So we want to study them all. And well, anyways, this is the version that I know about. So of course, that's the one I'm going to uh, tell you about. Some heavy bias there. Okay, I thought I would talk about so many more things in today's video, but I've already spent some time. So I'm going to leave it here and uh, I'll see you all in the next one. So... Thanks.